Hi and welcome to this podcast with your host Miriam Khan. Today I am so honoured to have Dr Shad Al Shamari on the show. Welcome and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Sometimes the Yorkshire accent likes to say it in a different way. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you Miriam. No you you did. It's, it's uh, exactly right. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I met you a while back doing um, a speaking event at this school that I work in, and it was a beautiful connection to be introduced to. But prior to that, I, I did a little bit of research when you were coming in to, to get to know you. And I was really um, honoured to, to come across this lady who's written so many literary texts and also is helping our, our community out in the Middle East as well to have this love and passion for literature. And also your ethnic minority, and yes. that to me, and female, and happens to also be on the support wagon of people with disabilities. So for me, I was like, a thumbs up, you know. Um, may I ask, how, how did you get into literature? What was your passion? Where did it start from? So uh, thank you for that really nice introduction. I'm really happy that you said, you know, trying to help her community. Um, I think for a lot of people, uh, they look at, you know, teaching and authorship as just a job. But, um, you know, for me, you know, living in the Middle East, growing up here, um, you know, I'm half Kuwaiti, half Palestinian. So I'm a hybrid. And, um, you know, I, I grew up in English speaking schools. Yeah. Um, I've always kind of felt out of place. I've always kind of felt, you know, like I'm trying to create a sense of belonging somehow. And, you know, the older I got, you know, once I got into teaching, I started realizing that, you know, I wasn't the only one feeling this way. Um, there's this bit of a generational gap between uh, younger people and the, pa the parents and their grandparents. And with all of the changes happening in, in you know, society, with social media, it becomes really hard to kind of maintain the same lingo, the same language between, you know, between these groups. And what I've tried to do in my work is sort of also talk to the youth, you know, talk to people, uh, not just the ones I'm teaching, but readers, uh, you know, in, in the region and, and, you know, also internationally, trying to cultivate a sense of uh, belonging to not a nation, but, you know, a support group, having friends, having a sense of, uh, you know, belonging to, a, you know, a community rather than just, you know, these markers, um, whether it's citizenship, uh, religion, uh, gender and, and uh, so on. Um, I fell in love with literature very early on in life. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I come from a, a background of having a Palestinian mother and, you know, a Kuwaiti father. And the only place I felt I was able to kind of, um, you know, make friends was actually through, you know, stories and, and fairy tales. And my mother would read to me all sorts of stories and then get me to write responses to these yeah. stories. And that's when I started realizing that, you know, I didn't need, you know, to have a big group of friends. I didn't need to be invited to every single party. Oh, you know, I was just happy to be, you know, at home with with uh, with my mother and our books, basically. Yeah. Um, as I grew older, I started realizing that uh, a lot of stories actually uh, had the same kind of the same kind of narrative uh, there's a struggle there's a journey and then there has to be at the end some sort of um wisdom gained or yeah. some sort of uh, realization that you come to and so i woke up one day um at the age of 18 and i couldn't walk i couldn't move it was a complete paralysis and uh, pretty soon I was diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis, which was um, a very, very difficult word for me to even pronounce, multiple sclerosis. I didn't even know what that was at 18. Um, so MS is a neurological uh, illness for, you know, those of you listening who might, may or may not have heard of MS. And it's, it's very common in actually the, the age group of 18 to 40 years old. Um, that's, you know, and it hits women, you know, twice as, 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 as much. And it's, um, they say it's really rare, but actually it's very common, especially in the Middle East and um, in South Asia. So very interesting, actually, that the studies and statistics still say, you know, it, it tends to hit Caucasians more and, you know, um, the Northern Hemisphere. But actually it's very, very common in our part of the world, too. 
Um, and again, um, having that diagnosis at 18 meant a complete sense of loneliness and a complete sense of um, sort of like a tragedy that hit at a very unexpected time. You you sleep, you know, happily in your bed, cozy, everything's going great. And then you woke up one day and you just can't move. Um, I was otherwise a healthy, uh, you know, young adult. I was playing sports. I was, uh, you know, very, very, you know, active. So there were no indications prior to that. I can relate. I really can relate because when I was 11, up till then, I was very sporty, athletic. And then yeah. from 11 till, was it eight, just before 18, I was paralyzed on and off. And I was also wow. in a wheelchair throughout that time, like you. And I, I literally was on my hands crawling oh, wow. because I also, like you, stopped and it wasn't MS for me. I uh, They found out later on in my life, through lots and lots of things, believe me, yeah. they thought it was a mental illness. I was doing attention yeah. from my dad. It was, course, yeah. it was apparently my ankle. There was all the sorts of things happening. It turned out yeah. I lost the cartilage in my hip, but it never showed on x-ray. So I totally oh, wow. relate. I yeah. totally understand. And alhamdulillah, thank God, whatever your faith is, thank God for two hip replacements. I'm better. Yeah. I can walk. I still have limited ability. Um, yeah. I don't know about you, people look at you and think you're able and fit, and I am, yeah. to a certain degree. Yeah. However, I have my limitations of what I can and can't, still can't do, but I'm yeah. grateful to that. But your situation, it's I, I know some friends with MS, it's yeah. unpredictable. It's very unpredictable yeah. with what happens. Yeah. And I think it's, it's it's really important to mention that you know with young girls and women generally when when something hits the body it it has a completely different effect um, and unexpected uh, consequences to you're suddenly seen as less than you know ideal yeah. um, so it, it really does affect your sense of self worth your sense of self esteem and you know no matter how resilient you are or no matter how hard you try to kind of make sense of it there's always a stigma. Yes. Uh, that society keeps producing it's a cultural and one as well it's absolutely. not just community i i found culturally like i grew up having two cousins one blesses got yeah. down syndrome yeah. gorgeous soul so yeah. smart so yeah. smart i had another one that was like on the autistic and asperger's set a, a, a spectrum but also had yeah. cerebral palsy there were some people in our family but they were, you would never see them very yeah. very rarely and and i grew up mm -hmm. i don't know about you that mm. they were hidden and it, and mm. sometimes they would come to your house and visit from another city and I loved them they had such beautiful like even when I'm talking to you, you can see my face lighting up yeah. they had just yeah. pure innocence and beautiful yeah. hearts but Absolutely. our culture and our, and our society keeps them separate and I know yeah. some of it's protection but some of it is also they're embarrassed which is not how it should be should it Absolutely. There's there's a sense of shame. And yeah. it's interesting when you say culture, because it seems to be a universal culture. So, you know, regardless of, you know, which you know country you grew up in or where disability and illness is experienced, it seems to be that there's a common understanding of it being shameful. Yeah. And, uh, you know, whether you're young or older, you know, people will look, people will stare, people will comment. There's a there's a lot of judgment uh, surrounding it. And I didn't understand any of that yeah. until I was actually put in in that position. So I would go to uh, college and, you know, I would be using a cane and, you know, a professor would say, you know, there's no need for you to come to class. If, if, if you're in pain, there's no need for you to come to class. And I would just be so humiliated in front of an entire classroom, again, with that sense of not belonging, again, with that sense of feeling like I shouldn't be here. Yeah. And you know, to make sense of all of that is very traumatic yeah. and very, very difficult to also uh, work with because yeah. your body is you. Your body yeah. is the and sense that, of... Uh, that person making that comment to you, you know, doesn't realise the struggle you've had to get dressed or to be able to <laughs> get to that place. I, yeah. I can personally recall physically not being able to put my trousers on. I had to have yeah. like a stick that I would grab that to push, yeah. dress myself. You know, not being able, not being able to get into a shower. You know, dis disabled things now in twenty twenty three are better. Not not one hundred percent. 
in some places, but there was no such thing as like a stair lift, you know, like yeah. the south, there was no such thing as like a disabled access to get into the shower, like a shower tray that you sit on and yeah. shuffle. Those things, you know, even the bar in the bathroom, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Those yeah, things yeah. weren't there, but they Ooh. don't realize how hard you've struggled just to get there. And then for someone to say that to you, it's not just, it's disheartening. They, they yeah. don't they don't understand that you want to be there you want to be yeah. heard and seen they make you invisible yeah. again which is yeah, which absolutely. defeats the object doesn't it so did you persevere well yeah yeah absolutely i mean at that age i i can't say i had the right vocabulary for it i just felt <laughs> a lot of i know <laughs> yeah. i felt a lot of anger and shame more than anything um sure. but um honestly you know i can't say that i you know knew what to do um my mother was very supportive i was very privileged and blessed i think uh, having that kind of uh, support and i know a lot of people um, you know, seem to assume that everybody has unconditional love from parents, but it doesn't seem to be the case. No. Parents are not always, you know, <laughs> these you know angelic creatures. Sometimes they add a lot more to the trauma, yes. and sometimes they make things a lot worse. Um, so I was lucky enough for my mother to kind of, you know, understand the disability itself, but also not want to be limited by that definition. Um, so, you know, she kind of sat me down and said, uh, things aren't going to be easy from now on. So she was very blunt, very frank. And, you know, she did say um, that it would be incredibly hard uh, to, you know, go to school, to be able to, you know, to make friends and to, to also kind of have a, what we would call a good life. And of course, d depending how you define that good life. Um, but the, what really kept me going was her will for us when i say us meaning her and i both not to 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 stop so there was no stopping so i didn't want to return after that comment at school i really didn't want to go back so i hid in bed for about a week until she said you know there's no <laughs> there's no way you're staying uh, you know at home for the next week and i've given you time because we always need time to kind of you know gather our strength again but a week is too long and you have to go back and so i hated for her i hated her at that moment and thought you know how cruel you yeah. know <laughs> and uh, it's not that you know she had to live with the disability herself here she was an older woman who hadn't experienced it and i was saying she didn't know what she was talking about but I'm really relieved now that, you know, she did kind of push me to go back into the environment which I felt rejected from. Yeah. And and that's how I kind of, you know, I continued undergrad uh, at the same university. And then um, I went abroad to the UK for, um, you know, a master's in literature and a PhD. And the same thing, within five days, I called her up and I said, nope, I'm returning. I'm back. To, I'm coming You're back done. home. <laughs> and very, very, you know horrible place people are, are treating me badly it was a very also sense of real realizing also the whiteness that i yes. hadn't experienced yes. before where did you study which city so i was in exeter ah, in, in the uk yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and there was also the sense of you know very very much you know these british circles yeah. and societies and you know being muslim i wasn't yeah. going to be invited anywhere or sure. going to fit some, in i mean some places are very multicultural but still there's a yeah. us versus them uh, and some places are not and it, it's it's hard intermingling sometimes isn't it yeah Absolutely. And, and you know, that came also as a wake up call that it wasn't just, you know, having the disability, but also just, you know, ethnicity and religion yes. was also a big part of why I wasn't getting invited to these gatherings yeah. and these parties and so on. So, you know, I decided, you know what, this place wasn't for me. And I also wanted to, to kind of return and to just, you know, return back home to a safe space. And, you know, my mother said I, she wouldn't talk to me if I, you know, dared to return. So there was, while it seemed like it was a very, again, very cruel kind of harsh um, method, it, it worked. That's, I think, where the idea of persevering comes from. A lot of people think persevering is, you know, just strength. But there has to be uh, this push through the pain for you to persevere. Whether it's emotional or physical, there has to be a push through the pain, not away from the pain, not ignoring the pain. But I really had to push through the emotional pain um, of being, you know, uh, different and and uh, trying to kind of um, still hold on. 
And so that that ended up being, uh, you know, part of my journey that I needed to constantly persevere. The pain was still there, the disability was still there, and and that sense of isolation was still there. But I ended up, you know, uh, finding myself through that process. So finding myself through the books, through the literature, um, through the storytelling. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how I ended up teaching literature eventually. Which is, be- which is beautiful because growing up for me, obviously I, I, my core background is English teaching as well and special yeah. educational yeah. needs because that's where, yeah. where that's where my passion has come from. But yeah. growing up, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm obviously first generation born in England. I'm, yeah. in, I'm, I'm in my middle 40s this year. It's scary to say that, but it is true. Yeah. And I can recall, like, the the brown kids, as we were referred to back in junior yeah. school, you know, we were all, like, clustered together by our teachers <laughs> back then. And I remember yeah. seeing this one lady who was a Jamaican teacher. So you, you can imagine growing up with everyone white and there's just one brown person that sort of resembles you but doesn't, if you get what I mean. Yeah. And what, yeah. what they did was they, they put all those brown kids together. So we had people from Bangladesh that were Sikh. We had people from Egypt. There was a cluster, whoever had come, yeah. you know, from, from different places. And they put, a, put us all together with this Sikh lady. Now, I just I was just fascinated by her sari because the colours were just wonderful. <laughs> Beautiful, you know, to yeah. see someone, um, I'd seen them in Bollywood films back in the day. And I'm talking, you know, 80s, 1980s. And I remember this teacher of mine who probably meant well, but said, yeah. just go with Miss and she'll understand all of you. And I was like, what do you mean? Well, she'll understand uh, your languages. And we all spoke English like I'm speaking now. But I think at that time, they were starting to think of ethnic minority groups. Now now in schools, you have EAL, English as a yeah. different language. It's a box. Like disabilities, it's a box. So who's yeah. in the classroom? But I, I, but I have to say to this teacher, sorry, sir, but Mrs. Sikh is a completely different faith, completely yeah. different religion. <laughs> No, it's yeah. not. It is, sir. Yeah. <laughs> and also, she, her faith is different to us. It's fine. We have a mutual trust and we can understand. But there was this still this, like, sounding rude, backward thinking, you know, like, yeah, the brown, absolutely. the same. No, and that yeah. was where it clicked for me of, I've got to go into teaching. I have ah. to because... Yeah. how can we have a, a room like this you can't that's where mine came from so that's why i'm saying to you it's really beautiful that you 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 persevered i'm proud of you for that because you don't realize these journeys have pushed us into different uh, aspects of ourselves. absolutely absolutely so you obviously went through that journey and you've persevered you pursued it and thankfully you know you you carried on and you came back to quit and what have you? What did you do since then? Because it's been an amazing journey since that time. Difficult one, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so once I came back to Kuwait, um, I had come to a realization uh, that disability was not a topic to be spoken about, um, not just in, in 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 my country, in my community, but also in the literature that I had read, in the books that I had read. So when I did uh, my PhD, I focused on mad women protagonists in literature and how nice. madness was presented in literature. And uh, it seemed to me that it wasn't just an English literature type of thing. It wasn't an Arabic literature type of thing. It was, you know, literature everywhere, mm-hmm. uh, regardless of the author, regardless of, of um, the background of the author. Illness and disability always, always presented in a very tragic yes. uh, light. Yes. And, and, and always, you know, the, the character with, with any specific illness, whether it was mental or physical, was kind of shunned and rejected yeah. and, and, and made to be part of a lesson, like a, a moral lesson. So if, if a, a woman misbehaved, then she would wake up one day blind, yes. you know. Or stuck up in an attic and locked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, of course. Like, you know, the, yeah. like, yeah, the mad woman in the attic, which, yeah. you know, I had studied, of course, yeah. Jane Eyre, but nobody had ever actually paid attention to what that actually meant so we were just looking at Jane Eyre herself as the you know ideal woman um but you know depression um uh, mental illness we never talked about that even in our readings of the text 
so I realized that even if I had wanted to teach literature, I also wanted to kind of create new narratives or new stories that could hopefully begin to challenge that that idea of, of illness and disability. At that point, um, it wasn't about me anymore. Yes. And I think that's part of the spiritual journey that when, once you realize uh, it's not just that you don't want to be alone, but you also want to extend parts of yourself to, to others and, and kind of, you know, reach out to other people uh, through whatever medium that you have. So you have the podcast to get people to, to, you know, to listen and to engage with you in a very vulnerable way. Yeah. For me, that was the writing uh, rather than just uh, the teaching. It was also the writing. So in a way, I felt that storytelling and, and literature would be the way to kind of start people thinking about disability and illness in, in a different way. I had also seen a lot of my students, you know, living with uh, epilepsy, with diabetes, yes. with depression and, and, and anxiety. And, you know, all of them would really struggle to ask for accommodation mm -hmm. in the same way that I had struggled to mm -hmm. say, you know, I do need extra time for the exam. My hand isn't working properly or whatever it was that, that I wouldn't uh, that I wouldn't ask for. So I realized that a big part of it was the shame that had still continued. It wasn't just about me, but it was continuing on to other generations. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't it wasn't changing. Educators weren't changing no. the way they thought right. of it. And either. And it, I mean, even here, whilst I, I've been here for like six years now and even yeah. in the last couple of years it has been beautiful to see it's not everywhere but I'm starting to see ramps being put in places yeah I start to see some disabled access I start to see even disabled spots with the signs it's so nice that it's happening you know at long last small changes but they're there you know and yeah. I'm sure there's a long way I know there is there's a long way to go <laughs> you know uh, and, yeah. and I remember fighting in the UK with my with my family at the time to just get my um, disabled access and badge. It's a, it's a hard process. And then for me, when I was able to walk, say to my father, it was a big ding dong. Dad, I think it's time now that I return this disabled badge because you also get a, a f financial allowance as well from the yeah. government. You have to. It's not yeah. an easy process. And I yeah. said, I want to give this back. And he looked at me like, what the hell? Because <laughs> we'd struggled for years to get that disability. That yeah. badge means you can park in disabled bays. It has your picture in now. Didn't you to? Because yeah. people lie, you know? No. God forbid people yeah. park in the spot and use it and their family member goes, they might be collecting them quite rightly from a doctor's surgery. But some people were yeah. not. Mm. And yet, some people pretending to be disabled and are not. If you get, if you get my drift. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. decided to return mine, and and I was like, he was like, why? And I said, look, they may be, I don't need this now. Thankfully, I can walk more than yeah, fifty yeah. fifty yards. I couldn't before. My back was always bent over. I was with, like you with a walking stick. Cause sometimes I'd be in the wheelchair. It depended. I had no. Yeah. I had no. Any day would be different, but yeah. I felt. I need to give that to someone else. Someone else needs it more than me. And thank God, yeah. thank you, God, for letting me walk again. If I do yeah. end up back in the wheelchair, okay, I can go back to option B. But I need to let someone else have that. Yeah. They need it, yeah. more, you know. Uh, but not everybody thinks like that, do they? Not everybody yeah. thinks of others. So it, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting how you're saying that because our journey through that is not easy. And sometimes it's not just the shyness and being scared. It's just having the confidence to say, this is my right. Yeah, this is my yeah right. absolutely. You know, absolutely. in the UK, we're, we're very lucky. We have disability acts and you know, um. we're a Sioux nation. <laughs> we have equality act. We have many, many laws that help them. And some countries always don't have that. Or if they do, they make it difficult, you know? Difficult, so, so, yeah. Access is easy. very difficult. Absolutely. It's not easy. That's why I'd gone into the special needs uh, background because when you were talking about um, accessibility to exams, that should have been a given right. That, yeah, that's one yeah. thing I would do as a SENCO. I give you, I do all the testing for you, and I yeah. would ensure that for exams for a student, you get, for example, twenty percent extra time. Maybe your seat has to be adjusted. Maybe you need something to lean on. Maybe you have to have a laptop. Whatever it is, I had one yeah. student, bless him, for nearly a year in that school that I taught in when I was senior leadership, he was blind in one eye, never said a word from school when he was little. 
when it came to his results and I was his senko at the time. And, and I was like, you know, there's nothing wrong with discussing what's wrong. What, what's the issue? And when he gained trust with me, when he knew that I understood and I had to say my background of what happened to me with my leg and my hip, he was like, she gets me. And he was yeah, Muslim yeah. too. So he understood. He was like, culturally, I can't say. I said, of course you can. And we made adjustments for him. So we, we were, as soon as he would, and I said, this is, a, you'd have to get over this. And when we, when he was able to, on each computer, whenever he logged on in the school, the um, technician, I made sure he'd, he'd adjusted the, the brightness, the letters. It was compulsory. But he was yeah. embarrassed. He made sure we got his um, exam papers and textbooks larger. I said, this is your right. You're allowed extra size paper. You're allowed extra time. This is your right. Take it. Yeah. And yeah. You know, it took a long time. It took nearly a good six months or so <laughs> to, to get him slowly, slowly to understand and then getting his relatives on board. But yeah. when he did, I was so pleased that when he resat that year, he passed. And he just said to me, thank you. And I said, no, you should thank yourself. Because yeah, you found yeah. your voice. You found you found your voice. And I said, now, hopefully when you go to university, you will speak up. Yeah, you know? and, yeah. and ask for right, accommodation. I yeah. understand what you're saying because yeah. you, people do suffer and they struggle. Absolutely. And they don't know how to say, this is affecting my mental health. It's affecting my well-being. I'm depressed. I'm, you know, they, they'll go through so many feelings, don't they, and emotions. Yeah. And they're yeah, overwhelmed absolutely. sometimes. Absolutely. And I think a big part of it is, is like you said, um, you know, the educating, uh, the educators, so the educational system itself, um, the way, you know, universally, we're still struggling with, you know, figuring out how to accommodate. Um, You still get a lot of educators who say, you know, that's not my problem, or I'm not trained in special needs education. Yep. Um, you could just, you know, Google <laughs> Google it and then try to figure out ways around it. You know, especially educators and, and researchers and scholars, you know, having decided to go into that, you know, path in life, then there has to be a constant process of figuring out how to teach a diverse population yes. of students. You don't necessarily always have the able-bodied student that, you know, is going to understand and figure out exactly what you need and, you know, be able to take your, you know, paper-based exam. So I've, I'm always so horrified when I hear the same kind of yeah. uh, mentality. I'm not qualified to to, to teach uh, people with disabilities or people with special wrong. needs That's education. It, it's called, yeah. I mean... Go, we call it differentiation in the classroom and not, right. not just that it's compassion as a human being you know yourself you've gone into education to help others better yeah. others but also you're there with children or young adults because yeah. you want to be so you have to have some compassion and empathy but you're right yeah. some people close the door on it I'm one yeah. of those people I think I'm everybody's mother <laughs> <So> <laughs> I'm like mother goose but I, do, yeah. I might not be able to find a solution, but I'll empathize with you and I'll listen to your query. I will try and find you then a solution. Yes, some things are out of my realm or remit because, yeah. yes, it's, I'm not technically paid for that, but I've got the experience for that. And, yeah. You're, yeah. and then sometimes there's a lot of red tape, you know? Yeah. So, so things yeah. don't change overnight. But it's beautiful that you're, you're like me, you understand. Uh, uh, and we do end up being like Mother Goose because we'll listen will be compassionate Absolutely. we and also they they know that you're the person to go to you're not going to, to judge to. as well yeah because you've learned yeah. not to yeah right? absolutely yeah, yeah yeah i think that's a big part of this um you know the healing journey yes. so i think you know we we talked about pain you know initially at the beginning of the episode but when we talk about healing or when we talk about how do you actually get from this point to, to that point, a big part of it is being able to connect with others, yes. uh, whether you're an author or, or a teacher or you work with people or you work with or you work with children, whatever it is really, but being willing to kind of open yourself up yes. and, uh, you know, extending something to, 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 to others. And I think I've been really blessed that I was sort of able to do that um, and also kind of take that initial step of saying, you know, I will 
try this out, even if there's a risk factor to it, especially in our part of the world, you know, being able to say, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman who living with a disability, there there can be a lot of consequences for that, whether in academia or whether in, in society. Um, so immediately you're labeled as um, not qualified, not able enough, not smart enough. Uh, a lot, not, yeah, yeah. a lot of barriers yeah. before you there's get started. There's a lot of barriers. Yeah. So I think that 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 is the initial pushback uh, against this uh, stigmatization and um, against this ableism that, that we have in society. So what I've done is with the books I've published, I've managed to to kind of connect with readers all over. I get really, really interesting emails uh, from from or messages on Instagram from readers who say, you know, I've never seen a book about, uh, you know, a Muslim woman living with a disability, an Arab woman living with a disability or, you know, someone in the Gulf region actually. Yes speaking so openly about what that means and uh, thank you now i want to write my own experience and um, i've been so ashamed i've been so afraid and i think that's kind of what's provided me with the sense of self-worth and purpose in in, in life um, it's really changed the way i look at not just myself but at at the idea of the body and how we think of, of the body it's it's a sense of everybody's kind of going through the same um you know the same uh, the same difficulty the same journey and we're all really trying to navigate uh, how how do i actually fit in whether fit in through this body or through community and, and so on yeah and and i think it's beautiful that your books are a token and support for others because you sometimes don't realize when you're writing your own books yeah. what the big impact of that book will be I realised yeah. that when I started self-publishing years ago and yeah. you, know, you go through that stage of, oh my God, am I doing the right <laughs> thing? Uh, should I publish this? And then when it's out there, it's out there. But then yeah. when you're getting heartwarming messages like you've just said, it really touches your heart and it really makes yeah. you think, wow, I, I am supporting and I'm comforting and I'm also giving like a security blanket to others. But also yeah. a bit like what your mum did to you, you give, you're pushing them, you know, you, you, you're following on that like message, aren't you, of you can do this, you can persevere with this and somebody out there gets you because you know yourself, quite a lot of uh, females in your particular predicament, my particular predicament, there's so much uh, racial stereotyping or prejudice, prejudice in other books, um, you know, prior to certain centuries and we're typecast in many, many ways. Yeah. So, so for yeah. having you write from an authentic voice, from yeah. an authentic standpoint, it has a big ripple effect, big, big ripple effect. Yeah. Because you're not only just speaking your mind, but you're changing the narrative too. And I'm proud of you of doing that. And we need more people like that, you know, we do. Yeah. So if there's other people yeah. that you're inspiring to write, I think that's friggin' amazing, as we'd say, you know, so <laughs> please, yeah. keep up, please keep up with that. She's well enough. <laughs> She's well enough a little bit, bless her. Absolutely. But it's true, but it's true because um, not only are your students blessed to have you in the classroom, you do, you're doing all these extra things and you've do, been doing these different workshops. I've been following you on Instagram. Yeah. And obviously in the bio for the, pod, for the podcast, we'll put your different links in. Um, yeah. And if people want to purchase your, you know, some of your literature or look at it or if they want to have a look at you on Instagram, I'm sure we can put that in the bio for those yeah. of you that are listening in. Because, you know, Dr. Shahad has got some amazing work out there and there might be other people listening to this podcast that can connect with you as well, yeah. you know, but again, yeah. they're too shy. What, what yeah. are you currently working on at the moment, workshop-wise? What have you been doing lately that we can let people know about? Absolutely. So a big part of uh, what I've realised is is people want to be able to write about their traumas, yes. but not in, in, in a kind of not alone. People don't want to do it alone. So I've been doing these workshops where we look at how do we actually write about our painful memories? How do we write about um, things that we, we otherwise are not ready to look at? So there's this idea of a safe space as you write. So you're kind of writing with others, not just writing alone. It's not an isolating experience. Um, so that's what I've been looking at. I've been doing some short story writing too. 
um, for different age groups and uh, been working with really, really young, uh, oh. with a really young age group, so 11 to 14 years old. And um, I, I teach adults, so it was very interesting to be able to, to have that shift and to kind of look at the creativity that's, uh, that's uh, you know, amongst the younger groups. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm always really interested in how we can actually begin to write about pain. Yes. Um, so I'm hoping to also hopefully go a bit more into narrative therapy. I'm looking at, uh, you know, different certifications that I can look into. I would really like to kind of pursue an alternative uh, path. So I teach at a university, but I would really like to kind of open it up a bit, uh, be able to work with older adults, um, you know, especially seniors, I feel like that's a group that tends to be really forgotten and, and really left behind, which is part of the age. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of them do have the trauma. I think it's beautiful because you, you're doing that cathartic analysis, but you're also doing the psychoanalysis and purging, you know, but not from a judgmental point of view. And going back to old fashioned trends of journaling and pen writing and, you know, um, nowadays with technology the way it is, which is amazing, don't get me wrong. Going back yeah. to the basics of let's just let's just think about this. It's beautiful. I think what you're doing yeah. is really beautiful and unique. Absolutely. And and the pen and paper thing is really funny. Uh, you know, also you know, in class the students will use the you know electronic devices, and we have a creative writing class. And a big part of this is me trying to get them to use the pen and paper again <laughs> because it does have a different cathartic effect yeah. once you hold the pen or pencil and you see your own handwriting on paper. There, there, there's a completely different psychological effect to being able to write uh, that way. And, you know, they've they've kind of resisted in initially, but then, you know, they've yeah. also said, yes, it, it has a completely different effect having that tiny right. notebook in hand and, you know, carrying that, you know, kind of like your 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 secrets, your, yes. your personal experiences within that notebook rather than on the phone or on an iPad. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people are sadly losing their motor skills, I've noticed, because we've become too reliant on the tech. And I'm, and I'm guilty yeah. of this at, at times. I am seeing <laughs> it from a special yeah. needs point of view. I'm seeing it that they're not able to hold their hand correctly. They get cramped. Yeah. All yeah. of this has an effect, you know, and yeah. this, this then causes more trauma within them because they're scared. But I think yeah. what you're doing is right. People do it with art therapy too, don't they? They do it yeah. in many, many other different forms. And yeah. one of the things I love about here is seeing the beautiful calligraphy in Arabic as well. So there's yeah. not just one language, not just English. You can write in many different languages as Absolutely. long as you are writing. I think that's yeah. the, that's the main message we want to get across. What you're Absolutely. Doing is, yeah, what you're doing is is amazing. And before we finish, because obviously we're coming up to the point where we have to conclude, what have you got any particular final thoughts? I mean, are you, are you happy to have people join your workshop if they're coming from abroad? Would you be happy to connect with others that might want to help you perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really, really kind of, um, I have this vision or this wish to, you know, really, really expand. I am the only person working on disability and um, disability studies and, you know, writing about disability in the Gulf region. And I, you know, I really struggled to find a publisher. And I did eventually find a publisher, but it was a very, very long road. I'm hopeful that, you know, the, the change is now it just it just has started so i'd like to go into you know how can we you know make films that are better representations yes. how can we get to you know change the way these television shows are also constructed yes. Um, so I'm hopeful that, you know, I could also try, uh, you know, something with, with script writing and screenwriting. And, you know, I'm working on a novel right now, which I hope will turn into uh, a movie. So th there's a sense of also reaching a wider audience. That's my hope and yes. my, my goal. Uh, because, you know, again, while... I, you know, there's a there's a nice population that reads the there's a larger majority that watches television and, right. and movies. Yeah, it's multimedia um, and multisensory, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that is a whole different can of worms. You know, disability is still not represented on in you know in a, in a in, a, in an authentic way for, uh, for these, you know, Hollywood representations and uh, Bollywood representations, and you name it, it's always the same kind of tragic ending. Yes. Um, so I'm hopeful that I could do more 
to to you know change that and hopefully inspire other writers and other um, filmmakers and directors and people who are you know um, influential in whatever sphere they're in to to kind of you know follow that that same kind of mindset. Good. I, I wish you all the best. Uh, I'm sure there'll be people listening in and you know inspired by quite a lot of things that you've said today. And and you know, li ladies and gentlemen listening, we will put her details in the bio. So please please feel free to reach out to her and help her in any way that you can. Um, obviously, the more people we have, um, and the podcast is international, so we don't know where people yeah. will be listening in. Some places in America, Canada, it's all over. So if there are if there is anyone out there who's willing to help her, please get in touch. And I am so honoured uh, to have you. You've, you know, I don't think this is the last time we've had a little chat. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I'm sure there's going to be several other podcasts because it'd be nice to see you on your journey and to see where we go. And yeah. you know, people like to listen in and see what the follow up is. So thank you yeah. so much. Honestly, it's been such an honour to have you and giving this humble and honest uh, outlook. Thank you very much for joining us on Range of Vibes. Thank you so much, Miriam, for having me. I really enjoyed the chat. Thank you. You're welcome.